When we talk like that, this, this always brings up a very interesting question now, and I think one that's particularly interesting to this, uh, to this group tonight. It goes like, hey, Roddenberry, how, how can you say that it's all just beginning when you wrote uh, some science fiction movies like Planet Earth and Genesis II, in which you predicted that the 20th century, our present civilization, is, go is going to collapse? And in answer, in writing the st Star Trek format, I never believed for a moment that Star Trek, the Federation, uh, uh, that future, was necessarily a direct, uninterrupted outgrowth of our present civilization with its emphasis on material things. But doesn't the collapse of some or all of what we have mean the end to all of us? Of course not. Humanity is an incredible creature. Knock us down, destroy our civilization, we'll get up and we'll build a better one on top of it. It's happened to us a dozen times already. For the rest of the world, as you know, Rome was the last time. Must have seemed as impossible to a Roman as it would seem to us that all that he had could come to an end. Paved roads which ran a thousand miles in any direction. Order, harmony, such as the world had never seen into that time. They even had the same language spoken from the British Isles to the Middle East. Now, for those of you who are frightened at the possibility that some of all of what we have is going to end, let's consider what happened in the case of Rome. The collapse of Rome, or perhaps better stated since it took some generations for it to happen, the disintegration of Rome, paved the way for much more than was lost. It was rather like churning ocean currents that bring nutrients to the top and spawn an incredible variety of new life. The fall of the Roman Empire and the rebuilding it followed spawned treasures far beyond the capacity of Rome, the Byzantine Empire, and Greece, the art of the Renaissance, the statues, the, the, the sculpturing, the painting, the humanitarian philosophies, the medical revolution, uh, that, that phenomenon known as Shakespeare, the, the music of Beethoven, in fact, uh, an in explosion of music that has really persisted in, until our sym symphony, plus our present technology, which in little over 50 years has gone from the first fabric and wood airplane to placing a man on the moon. Should the civilization fall? It happens there are a lot of factors which make a little shakeup seem almost desirable. For example, the Nuclear bomb is no longer the exclusive property of reasonable and mature nations like the United States, Russia, Red China, <laughs> France. We're only a few years away from any nation willing to pay the price having one. We are not much further away from large corporations and even extremely wealthy individuals having them. I must say the, the idea of ITT having an atomic bomb scares the hell out of me. In addition, we're beginning to fool around with DNA, with cloning, something that scares me uh, far worse than, uh, than uh, nuclear weapons. We, we are beginning to now learn to uh, isolate and soon be experimenting and manipulating the pain and pleasure centers of the human brain. Now, until now this has sounded something like pessimism, but actually I'm being an optimist. There are heartening indications all around us that some of our society will become unglued until before we are able to blast ourselves and our planet out of existence. Certain things we're facing, like the energy crunch, the food problem, and others. These may be, these may be in fact, natural checks and balances, protecting us while we slowly evolve into becoming an intelligent species. Perhaps, no, perhaps whether clear to, clear to us or not, these crises are happening as they should, as they were planned. I agree with Arthur C. Clarke and many others who say that, call it what you will, the Creator, God, Von Däniken space travelers, if you want to go that way, that any wisdom capable of putting intelligence on this planet is no doubt capable of plans that will protect it through its childhood until it is able to care for itself. I think it likely that we were meant to have another chance and another, and if necessary, still another until we have finally built an adult, 
reasoning civilization. And I wonder if you agree with my definition of an adult reasoning civilization. One in which the capacity to love has become as great as the ability to destroy. Speaking of racial childhood, actually brings us back to television. And it's hard to talk about television and st remain serious. <laughs> Perhaps uh, a few of the stories I, I promised to tell. That one of the funniest ones happened while making a show called, uh, a movie of the week science fiction uh, pilot called The Quester Tapes. And <laughs> well, for those of you in the audience that did not catch that uh, show, it was a story of an android robot he was outwardly indistinguishable from a human being, except that uh, uh, the programming of, of his computer mind made him incapable of hate, jealousy, greed, violence, and other television star qualities. <laughs> In the original draft of the show, Quester was searching for his builder, his creator, which the network officials thought was irresponsible on my part because whoever heard of drama where anyone was searching for anything like that. At any rate, the only way Quester could uh, locate the man who had designed and built him was through a very, very lovely lady who refused to talk. Fortunately, Quester was programmed in literature, which included the works of de Maupassant, from which he had learned that a female of the species will sometimes open her mind to a man to whom she has opened other channels of communication. <laughs> In the original script, the android then made love to her. He was programmed for excellence in many areas. <laughs> and he secured the necessary information. I was called to a meeting of the executives. <laughs> I was told that a robot doing that to a woman was clearly unacceptable. I presume it would have been unacceptable if he had done anything to a man. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can imagine the problems I would have had if I had written a gay robot. <laughs> I carefully explained to the executives that uh, the woman didn't know he was a robot, that none of this would be seen on the screen, and indeed he was doing nothing that other television heroes didn't do every night of the week. And a great argument ens ensued. I, I thought that at first that my opponents were showing a very natural and masculine uh, uh, jealousy over a mechanical man who could presumably do anything he wanted as often as he wanted, as long as he wanted. <laughs> but <laughs> but no, that wasn't it at all. I finally realized that our disagreement was much more basic. What they were actually saying to me is, but you, would you want your sister to sleep with a robot? <laughs> As some of you know, I lost the argument and Quester did not get the girl. But I went home rather happy that night because how often is it that a writer has a chance to create a whole new area of intolerance? Another incident, uh, uh, this will answer some questions asked earlier, uh, was another television movie, movie of the week called Genesis 2 that we made. And as a pilot for, thank you, as a, as a pilot for a potential motion, uh, for a, a potential science fiction series, it offered a range of stories and comment, I, I think as broad as Star Trek. And we did have the show tentatively sold to CBS. Then the CBS ran a movie, a full length widescreen movie, uh, directed by the very uh, fine director, Franklin Schaffner, which was Planet of the Apes. And it was tough comp competition, something like that, made with that budget. And in fact, uh, although Genesis 2 had been the highest rated Thursday night movie of the year, Planet of the Apes then went 12 Nielsen points higher. The, you, you can imagine what happened. The network programming office cried apes, the public wants apes. I, I, 
I said, wait, I, I, you know, I thought we agreed they wanted science fiction, and they said, Roddenberry, you ass, science fiction is apes. <laughs> <laughs> there was considerable panic at Warner Brothers Studios, where we had made Genesis 2. Uh, they, they said, Roddenberry, we've got to save Genesis 2. Isn't there some way you can add apes to your show? <laughs> or, or, or baboons or orangutans or something. Let me take you inside the studio. This is what really happened. A junior executive had one of those great front office ideas. He suggested that we consider the possibility that man's best friend had evolved into a species of hind-legged talking dog. <laughs> and, intend and intending to be sarcastic, I said, no, wait, I've got something better. I I I've I'm thinking of a turtle man creature, <laughs> which will give our show an underwater dimension. I think I first knew it was all over when I realized they were sitting there taking this suggestion seriously. <laughs> One other story, and this, incident, this is a Star Trek story which has never been printed or told. Uh, it answers, how did uh, Leonard Nimoy become the unemotional, logical Mr. Spock? And in the first uh, Star Trek pilot, which you'll see tonight, uh, after I'm done, uh, you will find a, an entirely different Mr. Uh, Mr. Spock. He does run around a bit, wringing his hands as things go on. The cold, logical, unemotional computer mind person was the second in command of the ship, who was, of all things, a female. And uh, because uh, we on the show feel very strongly about uh, uh, women's rights, and we did in those days, even before terms like <laughs> women's lib. So anyway, the, the number the number two the number two was was uh, in command was this woman. The network took a look at the picture, which they later turned down because it was too intellectual for you slobs out there. <laughs> and they said to me, "Get rid of the woman. No one will uh, will approve or agree with a woman being in command of anything." And at the same time, they said, "And and while you're at it, it while you're at it, get rid of the guy with the ears too." Well, it seemed to me that I could argue with the network and save one of them.